like Wordsworth, like Coleridge, um, indeed like Keats, De Quincey suffered the loss of his father when he was very young, eight years old. And from that time forth, as is the case with most children who lose a parent, De Quincey searched for substitutes. And in Wordsworth, he thought that he had found a substitute father, indeed his true father. But as is often the case um, in a father-son relationship, if the son is precocious, brilliant, and headstrong, the relationship is vexed. And that is certainly true of De Quincey's relationship with Wordsworth. When De Quincey was only 14 years old, uh, 1799, um, he first came into contact with Wordsworth through poetry. Uh, he was living in and around Bristol and Bath at the time, and uh, the publisher of lyrical ballads, uh, Joseph Cottle, located in Bristol, uh, had somehow put into circulation a copy of the poem from Lyrical Ballads, We Are Seven, which uh, is about a, a grown man coming upon a small girl who has lost two of her siblings to death, but yet treats them as if they are still alive, uh, saying constantly of her family, we are seven, when in fact the family is only five. This spoke to De Quincey on many levels. First, he was struck by the strangeness of it, such an odd subject for a poem, uh, but also having suffered the loss of his sister Elizabeth when he was six and she was nine, uh, which struck him to the very core. He was very much aware of how to cope with death, how a child copes with death psych psychologically. In any case, soon after this encounter with We Are Seven, De Quincey read the whole of lyrical ballads voraciously and basically at that point made it his life's goal not only to meet Wordsworth but to come become close with Wordsworth, to enter into Wordsworth's inner circle. So he finally got up enough courage by 1803 to write a letter to his master. Um, Francis Wilson, the great biographer of De Quincey, calls this letter De Quincey's first masterpiece of prose. Let's have a look at some of it. Um, here's how it begins. Um, what I'm going to say would seem strange to most men, and to most men, therefore, I would not say it. But to you, I will because your feelings do not follow the current of the world. Brilliant. What else would speak to the great egotist Wordsworth more than uh, the idea that there is no one like him in the world and only he can understand what is coming next in this letter? So here are parts of the letter following. From the time when I first saw Lyrical Ballads, I made a resolution to obtain the friendship of their author. In taking this resolution, I was influenced by my reverence for the astonishing genius displayed in those delightful poems, and in an inferior degree, for the dignity of moral character which I persuaded myself their author possessed. Since then, I have sought every opportunity and resolved many a scheme of gaining an introduction into your society. But all have failed. And I am compelled either to take this method of soliciting your friendship or of giving up almost every chance for obtaining that without what good can my life do one. I need to make your contact or what worth is my life. Um, he continues um, a little further down. What allurements can my friendship, unknown and unhonored as I am, hold out to you? This only I can say, that though you may find minds more congenial with your own, and therefore more worthy of your regard than mine, you will never find one more zealously attached to you, more willing to sacrifice every low consideration of this earth to your happiness, one filled with more admiration of your genius and of reverential love for your virtues than the writer of this letter. And I will add to that. Uh, and I will add that to no man upon earth except yourself and one other, a friend of yours, Coleridge, would my pride suffer one thus lowly to prostrate myself. 
So, uh, a masterpiece of a hero worship sycophancy to one might say. But it took a while for De Quincey actually to meet his hero. Wordsworth did respond to this letter. His response is rather cold and aloof, uh, basically saying, sure, I'll be happy to meet you because you certainly understand my poetry, I guess, and love it, and that's good. But I give friendship out um, very reticently. It's not a word I use lightly. Basically saying to De Quincey, I don't think we're going to be friends. Well, it took a long time for De Quincey to get up the courage to meet Wordsworth, um, even though Wordsworth in this response said, yeah, you can come visit. Of course, De Quincey was afraid the meeting would not go well. He was afraid Wordsworth would not um, like him, would not um, really want to have any kind of contact with him. So he, De Quincey, um, quite the schemer, decided the best way to uh, create a successful entree to Wordsworth was to get to know Wordsworth's friend, Coleridge. And he did this rather successfully. It turned out that he and Coleridge shared a, an obsession, opium, <laughs> as well as German idealism. So he found it quite easy, easy to once he did, to talk with Coleridge, uh, to gain Coleridge's um, affection, um, Coleridge's confidence, and he was also very good with children. So he got Coleridge's children on his side and ultimately got um, Coleridge's wife, Sarah, on his side. So in 1807, finally, he made his way with the Coleridge's to the Lake District and to Grasmere, and he met the great Wordsworth. And he was quite shocked at the physical specimen that he came into contact with. Uh, let me give you some of, of that. Um, let's see here. When he first saw Wordsworth uh, coming out of Dove Cottage in Grasmere, again, this is 1807. Is it possible? De Quincey later asked. Um, is it possible? Can that be William? How very mean he looks. Seen from the back, um, Wordsworth carried a sense of absolute meanness, uh, but he never looked worse than in motion, at which point he took on a twisted insect-like appearance, maneuvering himself at an angle and pushing his companions off the road. Um, this is a mix of De Quincey's own language and some paraphrasing of his biographer, Francis Wilson. But even though Wordsworth had a very weird body, basically his legs seemed too short and thick for his torso and head, and he seemed to have a very awkward walking style, which is odd when we think about how important walking was to him in his poetry. But his head, um, on the other hand, was quite wonderful. Uh, let's see. The poet's head made amends for the defects of his figure. Uh, again, this is a mix of Wilson and De Quincey. The brow was heavy, the nose arched, but the light from the eyes came from the depths below all depths. So what happens? Uh, eventually, uh, De Quincey works his way into the Wordsworth circle, the, the close circle, but he doesn't become friends with Wordsworth. Wordsworth is quite willing to use De Quincey as a tutor for his children. De Quincey was excellent at Latin and Greek. As a babysitter, um, De Quincey was good with children. As a landscaper, he did yard work for Wordsworth, um, as well as uh, a, a copyist, a kind of secretary. And De Quincey never felt that he gained Wordsworth's friendship. And eventually, this is part of what led to the break between the two men. They, they, never, they never fell into hatred of one another, but after a while, they could not be around one another. De Quincey found in Wordsworth a father who did not give him the affection he wanted. Uh, Wordsworth, for his part, uh, frowned upon De Quincey, uh, impregnating and then marrying um, a, a farm girl that... Ironically, Wordsworth found um, to be of a, um, a too low class, and he would not um, affirm De Quincey's marriage to this woman. He, he said, that's reason enough not for me to have De Quincey um, and his wife to tea. Um, okay, that's enough right now for the Wordsworth De Quincey.